So here we're going to use these two very nice diagrams from the textbook by John Winter to show how the mid-ocean ridge basalt region uh, can compare to what we see on continents in placed as ophiolites and then what we see <clears throat> in the seismic record of uh, the oceanic crust. So first some definitions. Morb, these are mid-ocean ridge basalts. There's the B. Ophiolites are packages of rock that have been obducted. Obducted is the opposite of subduction. So things um, that are thrust onto the continent. So thrust onto continents uh, at the edges of continents are these packages of oceanic crust. So if we have oceanic crust here, and then we have some continental crust here. It's possible the little flake of that material might get sandwiched and glued onto the edge of the continent, <clears throat> and we refer that to obduction, where the material gets thrust onto the continent rather than subduction, where it sinks downwards below. And so these rare cases of obduction of ophiolitic material give us an interesting geologic record of what the oceanic crust might look like. Otherwise, if we look at a mid-ocean ridge, we can set up some ocean floor seismometers. So let's let that be the ocean here. Uh, we can set up some seismometers on the ocean floor. There are a lot of earthquakes that are generated at the ridges and as those earthquakes are generated along the ridge, there, here's the ridge here. If you have an ocean floor seismometer here, you would have earthquakes that would take that seismic energy, reflect it off some of these layers, and then the ocean floor seismometer would pick up those travel times. So in this pink column or orange column in the middle, this is what we see on land. So this is an actual geological observation. Then what we're showing over here are the P wave velocities that we see when seismologists explore the ocean crust. And they are connected to these things here called ocean crustal layers. So let's take a look at this. For an ophiolite, this is what we might see on land. We might see a package of sediments. And then up underneath those sediments might be a layer of pillow basalts. Underneath those might be a package of uh, sheeted dikes, and then we might get gabbros and peridotites underneath that. So we get this entire package. Their thicknesses are given here. Notice that these thicknesses that we see on land are much thinner than what we usually see or what we infer from the seismic um, studies. So we think the actual oceanic crust, for example, has 4.7 kilometers of gabbro and layered gabbro, whereas we see a range of 2 to 5 kilometers in the typical ophiolite. So the typical ophiolite might match that maximum value, but more often than not, uh, we're seeing just a little bit less or quite a bit less than what we'd expect to see in a normal oceanic crust. And again, we get the maximum value here compared to the range that we see on land. Um, Part of that, part of the reason that we don't see complete thicknesses is this stuff is being tectonized. Notice here that we have peridotite that's being qualified with the adjective tectonite. And then we have a so-called layer, uh, layered peridotite. Where, where do those layers come from? Uh, this stuff is being stretched and pulled due to the obduction forces that are pushing this, this material onto the land. Uh, so it gives us these textures of... Um, uh, layered gabbro, layered peridotite, and um, in some cases we have unlayered but still tectonized peridotite. Uh, that is that is related to the tectonic forces, tectonic forces that are causing emplacement. All right. So what does it really matter for us? The the main thing here is to be able to map stuff from this diagram over here. So when we see these seismic layers or when we see the rock layers here in a typical ophiolite, they can be connected to what we think is the model that describes the mid-ocean ridge system and the ophiolites that would derive from those. So the mantle here would be these peridotites down here. These gabbros that are forming off in the wings, that would be these gabbros layered at the bottom, perhaps unlayered up at the top. Then these sheeted dikes that were the cause of the delivery, uh, they were the conduits 
that allowed milt to be extruded up at the top as, as pillow basalts. Those sheeted dikes here are these things here. These are the pillow basalts here that make up layer 2A and 2B. And then this orange material that's sitting here out on the surface, those are sediments. So once this continental, uh, once this oceanic crust has been created, uh, there are pelagic sediments that will rain down and build up this thin layer, and that's the deep sea sediments that are shown here. So this model here, and that's what this is, this cartoon is a model for what we think is happening. This model is how we explain what we see in an ophiolite when we look at these particular uh, types of rocks in outcrop, and it's also how we explain the P wave velocities in the various layers. When we talk about layers, that comes from the uh, seismologist community. Uh, when they talk about layers that have a certain velocity, like 6.7 or 7.1 kilometers per second, they're talking about certain rock types, but there are a range of rock types that can have these kinds of velocities. So they, they kind of hedge their bets. Instead of calling this a gabbro or a peridotite, they'll just call it a layer, and that layer will be 3A or 3B, for example, if they just want to indicate that layer that has this velocity. Now, why would they hedge their bets? We'll just give you one example. You might say, well, look, peridotite is at 8 kilometers per second. Maybe anything at 7.1 must be a gabbro. Just skip layer and call it a gabbro. Well, a seismologist would say not so fast. If we have mantle that is very, very hot, we can actually decrease its velocity to something close to 7.1 kilometers per second. So when we see this value of 7.1 kilometers per second in the P wave signal in a seismic study, it could be gabbro, but it also might be peridotite that is very, very hot. So they don't always know precisely the composition and the temperature, and there are these trade-offs. We might uh, take another example, another, another video to explain those kinds of complexities. But the bottom line for us is to relate this model to these geologic and seismic cross-sections.